Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. So when you're looking at medicine, you've probably heard of hemoglobin A1C, or sometimes it's called A1C, and maybe you know that it can be an indicator of prediabetes or diabetes. Well, let's in this video understand what A1C is on a molecular level, and then we'll see how it actually causes some basic dysfunction in the body. So first of all, right here we have a red blood cell or an erythrocyte biconcave disc, right? If we zoom in on the red blood cell, we know that it contains lots and lots of hemoglobin. Here's a ribbon diagram of the protein hemoglobin, and you can see the four hemes there that bind oxygen. Now with hemoglobin, there are four subunits, that is four protein subunits. There's two alpha and two beta. Now for our purposes here, we're really just going to have them represented by these four simplistic circles, and we're really just going to look at one of them for simplicity because the process we're about to look at can happen on any one of these four subunits. Okay, So hopefully this makes sense. We're just going to take a look at one of those subunits of hemoglobin. It could be the alpha subunits or it could be the beta subunits. Now, you've probably seen this slide elsewhere in my channel. This is where we talked about advanced glycation end products or ages. Now, what the heck do these have to do with hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C? Well, right here, this is just some subunit of hemoglobin, and it's composed of amino acids that are strung together. Now, this one right here is lysine. Lysine plays a lot of roles with this kind of stuff because the nitrogen here is extremely reactive. Now, down here, this is the molecule glucose. Now, you may have seen glucose in its cyclic form. Actually, glucose has three forms that it exists in the blood. And the two major ones are two cyclic forms where it forms a ring. This one over here is alpha glucose or alpha D-glucose. And over here on the right, which is the predominant form, is beta D-glucose. And then there's a form here in the middle called the linear or the straight chain form which exists only to a very, very, very small extent. But what you can see here is that the alpha form interconverts with the beta form. Okay? Again, the beta form constitutes about 64% of glucose in the blood at equilibrium, whereas the alpha form is 36%. But in order for the alpha form to convert to the beta form and vice versa, it has to move through this intermediate, meaning the cyclic form has to acyclize into the linear form and then recyclize back into the, the different cyclic form. And so to some extent, there's going to be a linear form of glucose in the blood. And it turns out that that linear form is a lot more reactive. Let's see what happens. So the very first step is these lysine amino acids on the hemoglobin are going to attack the glucose aldehyde right here. Okay? This aldehyde on glucose is extremely reactive, and it forms a covalent bond, as you see right here. So initially, you have a lysine nucleophilic attack. It's important to understand that this process does not require an enzyme. It's spontaneous. It occurs all by itself. And so the more glucose you have in the blood, the more likely this reaction is to, is to occur, and the more of this that will accumulate. Now here I have this nitrogen of the lysine covalently bound to glucose, but we're not finished here. We're then going to have an elimination reaction. So this nitrogen carbon bond right here is going to form a double bond with the loss of this OH group as water. And so this nitrogen carbon double bond is sometimes called a shift base. And this form over here is more stable than the previous form over here. Again, that makes it less likely that this form over here will spontaneously reconvert to this and then eliminate glucose. So once you get to this form, you're kind of stuck. But to make matters worse, it'll react further to form an even more stable arrangement. This reaction right here is called an amidori rearrangement. And it's a fairly complicated mechanism, but basically this shift base right here, nitrogen carbon double bond, gets converted back to a single bond uh, with the formation of a carbonyl bond right here. This OH group essentially gets oxidized into a ketone. This form is the most stable of all four of these. So once you get to this form, it's not going backwards. It's pretty much stuck like that. 
And now, because glucose has effectively become covalently bound and pretty much permanently bound to this lysine, we can say that the hemoglobin has been glycated. Okay? You can see over here, here's a normal healthy hemoglobin. I don't have any of the amino acid residues shown. But once you have chronic hyperglycemia, so glucose is elevated in the blood for a for a long period of time and consistently, over time that hemoglobin is going to become glycated at multiple sites. Again, there's a lot more sites uh, than just these three. I haven't shown them on these other two subunits. But basically, anywhere you have a lysine residue exposed, you have the potential for glycation. So here's three sites that have been glycated, two on this one subunit down here, one on the red subunit. And once you have significant glycation of that hemoglobin, it's now termed hemoglobin A1C, or HB, which is the abbreviation for hemoglobin A1C. Now, A1C has nothing to do with the name of the subunits. In fact, the name A1C actually has to do with when this was originally discovered via chromatography, it turns out that the fraction that was eluded that contained this was the 1C fraction. So this A1C has nothing to do uh, with anything with the structure of hemoglobin. Okay? It has to do with the procedure that was used to discover it. Okay? But this right here, this is literally A1C. It is glycated hemoglobin. Now, why do we care about glycated hemoglobin? Because it's an indicator of diabetes. So we all have some degree of glycated hemoglobin in the blood, but normally that level is gonna be below 5.7%. In other words, we wanna have less than 5.7% of our hemoglobin glycated. So it's gonna to happen to some extent, but you can imagine with chronic hyperglycemia and chronic exposure of the hemoglobin to glucose, that percentage will gradually increase over time. Now, if we look here, once you have that uh, glycation percentage or the A1C percent above 5.7, now you're into the pre-diabetes realm. And once it crosses above 6.5%, now you have type 2 diabetes. Now, again, like we mentioned, you can progress on this flow toward the right, so from normal to pre-diabetes to diabetes, with really a poor diet that contains excessive sugar and also a sedentary lifestyle. But this is also, in the case of type 2 diabetes, reversible because you can go the other direction from diabetes back to pre-diabetes, back to a healthy A1C level with a healthy diet that's low in sugar and also exercise. Now you might ask, why is it so bad that hemoglobin gets glycated? Why do we care about this A1C? Well, back to this picture right here. So here is one of our subunits of hemoglobin. It's got this lysine amino acid residue, and it's, of course, been glycated. Well, it turns out that when you have a lot of these glycated hemoglobin molecules, they act as advanced glycation end products, or ages. And remember what we talked about in some of the previous videos over ages. The ages can bind to a receptor called the RAGE, receptor of advanced glycation end products. And when an age, like A1C, binds to this RAGE, it really induces the activity of a couple of pathways. There are others, but these are two important ones that explain the pathophysiology. The first over here is this NADPH phagosome oxidase, or NOx. This is, enzyme is the committed step in the production of free radicals, basically reactive oxidative species. And these free radicals, when they're produced, can actually oxidize LDL. And when LDL becomes oxidized, then that LDL can stick inside uh, the walls of arteries and it contributes to atherosclerosis. So what this shows is, by glycating proteins like hemoglobin, that sugar indirectly causes LDL oxidation and atherosclerosis. Again, because it activates this pathway for the production of reactive oxidative species. Another pathway that A1C can activate through RAGE is the NF-kappa-B pathway. I won't go into too much detail with this because we discussed it in a previous video, but it suffices to say that NF-kappa-B, which is a transcription factor in immune cell cytoplasms, can actually go into the nucleus and induce gene expression of all sorts of inflammatory cytokines. These inflammatory cytokines do a number of things, one of which 
is further increase the production of reactive, reactive oxidative species. So they can also uh, further activate this NOx pathway. But also these inflammatory cytokines can induce platelet aggregation, uh, particularly because they can induce the production of thromboxane A2 and shift the overall metabolism of cells towards the production of thromboxane A2 and less of prostacyclin, which is anti-platelet aggregation. They also induce leukocyte migration, so immune cells come to the area and also indu induces them to proliferate and differentiate. And so overall you get massive immune reactions in areas and coupled with this LDL oxidation, you get atherosclerosis. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding what A1C is, why we might want to track it in somebody who has prediabetes or diabetes, and how it actually produces these effects. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.